name is Shai, and I've been making puzzles for roughly a year now. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate my process on how I approach making a classic Sudoku with advanced logic. I'll be using my puzzle Valtteri as the example. Uh, I'd like to thank Simon and Mark for the opportunity to feature this video on the channel and for covering the puzzle in the first place. It really means a lot to me. So, stage one, the idea. To start with, a little bit of backstory behind this puzzle. This was made for an ongoing classic Sudoku pack, which I'm working on with a few friends you may already be familiar with, where we've set out the goal to make tutorial-like classics for as much different Sudoku techniques as we can. Now, there are a lot of classic Sudoku techniques, and much more than the list on Andrew Stewart's site would suggest as well. Notably, there are a few very complex techniques most people might not have heard of. Exosa is something I'd been vaguely familiar with for some time. I'd read Philip Newman's posts in the Theory and Programming channel on the fan discord, which outlined the conditions for an Exoset, what is affected, uh, but I hadn't fully grasped yet why it worked. Now, before I go any further, I should probably make sure we're all on equal footing here, so I'm going to give a very quick and dirty rundown of how a basic junior exoset like this works. The only piece of knowledge I'm going to assume familiarity with is fish patterns, like X-Wings and Swordfish. If you don't understand these already, there will be a link in the description to a podcast video from David Clamage and Philip Newman, which should definitely get you up to speed. So with an exoset, we're dealing with several of these fish patterns, overlapping in the same rows or columns, and sharing the exact same cells in a specific band or stack. Except these fish aren't completed, so each of them don't give any eliminations on their own. In Valtteri, there's three almost sword fishes on twos, threes, and fours. And the critical thing to notice is that in this middle band, boxes four, five, and six, the near fish patterns all share these four cells. What we can see from this is kind of useless in terms of individual digits, but it amounts to something rather beautiful and combined. And that is that there must be a 2, 3, and 4 in these four cells here. Now in Valtteri this can be taken further by noticing one other observation, but I'll speak in general terms here for all extra sets. What we need now are some cells that see these four cells, which are limited to the exact same candidates that the near fish are built on. These are called the base cells. From this we can notice since these candidates must appear in the four common cells of the exoset pattern, any combination of these base cells is going to force the same two candidates to appear here in what's called the target cells. Now this not only limits the target cells to being just 2, 3, 4 in this case, but we also now know that there is a direct equivalence between what ends up in the targets and what ends up in the base. The next big thing an exoset does is all our almost fish become real fish, at least in the bands outside uh, of the one with the bases and targets. Why? This is because the arrangement is now maximal. We've in a sense completed our fish patterns because it's not possible to fit any more twos, threes, or fours in this case in those four cells that we talked about prior, otherwise it's going to break the bases or the targets. This gives loads of information all over the grid, and exosets don't stop there, believe it or not, but I'm not going to spend more time covering it all. If you'd like to learn more about them, there are more resources in the description as well. Back to the video. I decided at some point to attempt to create one. This is something I do a lot when I'm learning new pencil puzzle genres, to teach myself how it works. I dive in headfirst and I familiarize myself with the general properties of whatever it is I'm trying to create, be it a new puzzle type or a new technique, like with the exercise here. So I figured it wouldn't be a bad idea to learn it this way, uh, and if all went well, I'd have a puzzle with a working exercise, which would be awesome. For many puzzles, I start with an idea, a challenge, a concept. For classics specifically, um, I find it very fun to try and make a one-stepper, as we in the business like to call them, which is essentially just find the one trick and it all falls uh, to pieces. For Valtteri, I started in the voice chat uh, in the Discord, where I often stream puzzle setting and solving. Uh, I started by getting a quick refresher of the exoset conditions, and I moved on to stage two. Stage two, setup and telegraphing. So we begin with setting up the main attraction, be it a single deduction or a sequence of a few leading from one to the other. 
I used fpuzzles.com for the bulk of the creation of this. It's particularly great for setting classics with advanced techniques because it doesn't have much advanced techniques programmed into it in the first place. So if your puzzle is able to defeat the solver, you probably did well in limiting possible bypasses. Unless, of course, there's an easy advanced technique F puzzles also doesn't know. I'll talk about this in greater detail in a later stage. For those used to sitting variant Sudoku who haven't tried their hands at classic much, this may seem difficult. As given digits only provide two pieces of information on their own, those being eliminating that value from the rest of the house and eliminating every other value from that cell. Also, some quick terminology, a house is kind of like a unit. Uh, in a Sudoku, it's a row, a column, or a box. And it's just how we uh, define those collectively. It's also where the word full house comes from, which is the last value to appear in a row, column, or box. In Veltere, I started by limiting three columns in different stacks of the grid, filling them with values from five to nine, and leaving open four rows in two bands of the grid. And some more terminology, a stack is a group of uh, columns which align in, in, in terms of boxes, and the band is a group of rows. All this was uh, set to set up the cover houses of the Exoset, uh, which is just a fancy word for explaining the, you know, the fish patterns. All I then needed was two of each base candidate, affecting those empty positions uh, in the columns. Early versions of this puzzle looked a fair bit different to the finished result, I was trying at first to set up a 4 candidate XO, but quickly abandoned that. More notably, it wasn't rotationally symmetric. The base cells were in the left stack. Uh, at some point though, Philip Newman suggested that I could make it symmetric with a quick morph, and I decided to do so not just because it looked prettier, but rotational symmetry is a good way to draw the solver's eyes to the middle of the grid, where the bulk of the XO now lied. Uh, this is one of the small things you can do as a set to best telegraph the idea of the puzzle. And telegraphing is the aspect of setting a classic, or setting any Sudoku or puzzle really, which I consider the most important of all. If the solver doesn't know where or what to even look at, they're likely to end up bifurcating or quitting altogether. And the solver's experience is the most important part of setting a puzzle to me. Telegraphing in Exocet is hard, since it's naturally difficult to spot, but I left a few little easter eggs that would suggest to the solver they're on the right trail. Um, I made all the corner cells visually isolated, and their values were that of the base candidates, so 2, 3, and 4. Uh, I used consecutive low values for said candidates, and as I mentioned earlier, I used symmetry to my advantage. The biggest thing, uh, however, which would help the solver find and, and understand the pattern, uh, was I made it slightly easier. I limited row 5 enough so that another similar but slightly different way of solving could be found. While making the setup, at some point it clicked with me that I was making a whole bunch of almost swordfishes, which were restricting four cells in the middle band. By limiting one to two places in row 5, it could be viewed instead as an unorthodox quadruple using the exoset pattern, and using the value 1 specifically to suggest that this is the missing piece of all these 2, 3, and 4 almost fish. And what was nice about this to me was that it could still be solved with a regular exoset too. Okay, stage 3, idea effectiveness. So when you've managed to get a working setup, the most effective way to make progress is to hone in on what eliminations you get from it and build off those carefully. For me, I had a few options because exosets cause so much damage to, <laughs> to a puzzle, but even then, because of the complexity of the technique, it's very easy to accidentally open up a simpler path. This stage of the setting process has a lot of trial and error. Uh, cross-referencing with more powerful solvers to see full progress, unwinding progress that isn't quite right. It's a bit finicky and requires you to be clever and efficient with your digit placements. In general, try to avoid weakening or resolving too many cells. In the final stages, the rules of Sudoku itself will often tidy up 90% of the ambiguities, so instead you're looking to target stronger cells, areas of the grid with less information. Also, be very mindful of your bilocals, that is, anywhere digits are limited to two positions in a house. Simon was right when he called these the bedrock of advanced techniques. If you make too many extraneous bilocals or damage the ones you have set up too much, it will likely crumble too quickly, and the intended logic could easily be bypassed. 
Uh, same sort of thing for bivalue cells, they're also quite weak. Anything that creates strong links is usually going to, to open up uh, possibilities that you might not have, have been wanting. Another general tip that's good for the early stages is to highlight cells you plan on having givens in, but not actually place the givens specifically yet. Instead, just write a few options that work with your plans. That way, if you need to, to remove a potential placement for a value later on, or need a specific candidate removed from a house, uh, you may be able to use the undecided cell. This tends to be less effective the more information is already in the grid, because at that point the puzzle becomes too fragile. In the final version of Valtteri, I used the limitations of the target cells for hidden singles, which ended up being the 6 in box 6. It fed into box 3 nicely by giving a pair and then a 4 in row 2 column 8, which bounced back by locking 4 in box 6 and taking the solve much further. I had also planned ahead a little bit by leaving row 7 open in terms of 2s, 3s, and 4s, since it gives a triple in the row using the fish eliminations of the exit set. This was done for solvers who didn't use the mirror logic or the quadruple version of seeing it. They'd still be able to find a way to crack open the puzzle with the right pattern. After much fiddling, I got a permutation of the setup working that allowed for both these deductions to coexist and progress the solve to the same point without having the puzzle topple over yet. As I say, quite a bit of trial and error. You, you may sometimes need to actually just completely take out uh, your original setup and try a different one, just because the original isn't working the way uh, it was intended. This brings us on to the tricky and annoying stage. Stage 4, finalizing and uniqueness. So once you have a setup that's secure and we're using the intended logic, the puzzle gives way. Uh, it's all a matter of making it unique now. If the prior stages weren't finicky enough, well strap in because here is where you'll likely end up pulling your hair out. During these final moments of the construction process, I recommend taking a step back not thinking about the exact specifics of how the puzzle will resolve, but instead targeting those stronger cells in places of the grid that aren't unique yet, still being mindful to avoid damaging by locals or placements that would uh, bypass the setup. At this stage of, of construction, it's a really good idea to have two solvers running on it, one which has the intended technique turned off, and the other which has it turned on. This way, every time you test a placement for a given, you can see the damage it deals to each grid and rule out anything that ruins the idea. This is why I like sitting with F-puzzles for classics. The deductions it's limited to are ones that are well known enough for the average solver to feasibly find instead, even accounting for its contradiction steps that are able to grab stuff like W wings and XYZ wings. The big issues I had in Veltri was deadly patterns arising in columns 4 and 6, since there wasn't yet any information in these columns. I wanted to keep symmetry, and after getting some unique grids that weren't one step, I knew, or at least felt strongly at the time, that it could be done in two more givens. The best spots to place givens at, these, uh, at this point seemed to be rows 2 and 8, since 4 in box 8 at this point was locked into row 8 columns 4 and 6, and by placing something other than a 4 in one of those cells, then placing a 2 or a 3 uh, in row 2 columns 4 and 6, the symmetrical counterpart, I'd be able to cause a lot of damage to one of the base cells, at least that was my intention at the start. But when I placed the 1 in row 8 column 4, and I ran the solver, I, I was brought down to just 3 solutions, and I got incredibly lucky because the final deadly patterns lied on the rotationally symmetric cells. So I was able to add a 2 in row 2 column 6 and it was unique. And one step. Now that doesn't always mean it's a success though. Uh, but it's very exciting when you get this result because it leads, it leads right into the final stage of the process. Stage 5, bypass checking and test solving. So the first thing I do when I find a working grid is I throw it into a powerful solver to see how it fares. And for this, I recommend using something called YZF. It has an extensive list of techniques and many of the more notoriously complex ones like multi-sector locked sets, death blossom complexes, SK loops, uncommon fish patterns like mutant and frankenfish, and it even indeed has exosets. And it does exoset logic 
better than any other solver I know of. It knows senior, double, and all the various el eliminations uh, that each can have, like compatibility testing, mirror logic. It knows the whole deal. In the end, YZF was able to find a convoluted path through the puzzle without the exit set, but it used 11 alternating inference chains, among other nonsense like a grouped, almost locked set W-Wing. Uh, so in terms of bypasses, I felt pretty secure in this. Of course, the solver only shows logical progress that can be made. It won't show areas of the grid that are susceptible to easy bifurcation, but you can get a good general feel for the security of the puzzle. If you are concerned about logical bypasses, um, click Find All Steps under the, the Tool tab and scroll through the options it gives. My only concern in terms of bypasses in this puzzle was one MSLS, which is analogous to set equivalence theory, which was similar to the Exaset setup in terms of rows and columns used, and it came about from the limitation I put uh, on row 5 which locked 1 into two positions, the same limitation I was using to better telegraph the puzzle. Since I figured there were similar enough approaches, I didn't mind this as a potential bypass, and since SET is already pretty advanced in, in itself, and it was already incredibly tricky to get this puzzle to even work as one step and discoverable in the first place, I felt that this was okay. I was fine with this. The final thing to do now is test solve the puzzle, and this is a pretty cr crucial step, because even if the computer says it's all basics and it's able to fly through it, that doesn't account for how easy it is to spot by human eyes. For example, uh, naked singles that are four values each in a row and a column, those are pretty hard to spot, but the computer will see those immediately. Likewise, gained digits uh, that create pointing pairs are easy to miss if you don't notate three or more positions a digit can be placed and you are rushing through with a flurry of activity. The best way to get a puzzle test solved is either to ask a trusted friend or post it in the testing submissions channel in the fan discord where many solvers are actively testing various different kinds of puzzles. Um, but if you don't get any solves, don't feel upset. This is somewhat common, given the influx of setters uh, posting in the server these days. One thing you could do with a classic Sudoku, though, is morph and relabel the puzzle so that you no longer recognize it and try to solve from there, because it will feel like a fresh puzzle, but the logic will not have changed at all. So if you're able to spot the poorly telegraphed version of your logic, solvers are probably going to be able to find it in the finished version. And just to quickly touch on what morphing and relabeling is, morphing is just uh, switching rows and columns uh, or stacks and bands of the grid such that no information is changed, it just looks different. And relabeling is changing the actual digits themselves, since in a classic Sudoku the digits don't really mean anything. Uh, ones could be replaced with sevens and eights can be replaced with fours and it wouldn't make any difference. The only difference it would make would be in telegraphing. In an earlier version that I mentioned before, uh, I did manage to make a one-step exocet, however, it used a mirror elimination that I felt was not fair enough to expect a solver to spot. It was along the lines of if 4 in this cell, because you couldn't then put 4 in the base cells, it would go here, and that breaks 4s in this unrelated row of the grid. It was just too much look ahead, and unfortunately there wasn't anything simpler to eliminate 4 from that cell, so I scrapped it to find something better. After my own test solve of the final better version, which was basically fresh since so much of the grid was resolved with the final two givens that I had no idea how the after part resolved, I felt that this one was pretty good. So I gave it one last relabel of the givens to make the solution read uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 in order in row 5, uh, and I put it up for testing in the server. I was blessed to get many test solves with varying results, such as test solves from people who knew the technique already and was able to spot it, solves from those who didn't know the technique but were able to work it out on their own, which was amazing, and I did get a few people who hadn't caught the intended deduction and got through with alternative means. Now when someone doesn't find the right track, don't give them a hard time for it. Instead offer to show what it was you intended and ask to see if they think it's a fair spot. I mean, after all, if they weren't able to spot it, that could be on you for not making it 
telegraphed enough. And so that might be the area which you need to go back and improve on for the puzzle. Also, be open to hear what they found in instead, because sometimes it might be cool logic. It might not just be some bifurcation. They might have found something really cool and interesting. And it might make you want to hone in on, on that idea instead, or save it for a different puzzle at least. So definitely listen to your testers when they find something interesting. I really want to hammer home the importance of the test solving stage, because the most important part of setting a puzzle is accounting for the solver's experience, for me at least. It's the reason telegraphing is so crucial, and why it's best to avoid too much tricky to spot basic techniques. After all, if you're solving a puzzle and just managed to find an exoset, the last thing you want is to get hung up on some obscured naked single or something. If you tested the puzzle yourself and or had testers find it enjoyable, you're at the end of the road and now it's time to publish it. You could do so on Logic Masters Germany or the Discord Puzzle Archive or anywhere else you see fit, like a personal blog or maybe even sending it in to Cracking the Cryptic to try. And that's more or less how I made this classic. Uh, not the only way you can go about it, and much like how they solve, the setting experience of making a puzzle is different every time, hinging on whatever idea it is that began the puzzle. Setting a classic is, is usually pretty tricky because you're so limited, and it's a puzzle in and of itself. How do I create this one thing, and how do I make it so that the puzzle is enjoyable and spotable? With each one you make, you learn more and more about uh, how the fundamentals of Sudoku click together, and you get to grow as a setter. You get to learn new tricks and techniques and deductions that you might not have learned before. And then you can take these things that you've learned and you can apply them to other areas, like variant Sudoku. You could bring in, say, a swordfish or something into a variant. Just lastly, uh, once again, a big thank you to Simon and Mark for this opportunity. I hope that this was insightful, and I hope it inspires people to try and make their own classics. I, for one, would be thrilled to solve more. Thanks for watching.